Justin and Will on Just Hoop Talk is one of the best podcasts out there if you want to talk that hoop game. If you don't get with these guys and get right, you're going to get left. Big ball is out, baby. And I holla. Hey, guys, you're watching Just Hoop Talk podcast on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and to our podcast on all streaming platforms. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Just Hoop Talk. You're with Justin Henry, Will Thompson, and we have our player analyst on board, Cody Demps. Cody, how you doing, man? Doing good, man. So happy to be on. Thanks for having me. Appreciate y'all. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we're here to talk playoffs, man. It's been an interesting playoff so far, really competitive. And there's been a lot of really close games, close series that we've seen. And we just saw one closed out, the Lakers and Rockets, man. Yes, sir. Will, what is your take on Lakers Rockets in the series that was? We saw the Lakers go through them in five games. Yeah, I mean, I think it looked like the small ball experiment failed for sure. It, it did sure. not look good. Sure. Game, game one, it, it looked like, oh shit, this might work. Um, game two was kind of close. I feel like <laughs> the Lakers really closed the door at the end of game. Two. They really established themselves and uh, put that whole thing to bed pretty quickly it, it didn't look good after game two mm-hmm. yeah it was it was that kind of series man I feel like they figured it out Cody you know you seen the, yeah. the Rockets came out swinging game one they got the win and then Lakers yeah. closed out what were your thoughts overall on the series man my thoughts were uh, the exact same thing man that small ball type of offense doesn't seem to be working out it seems to work during the regular season you get a bunch of wins like the Rockets did but doesn't seem to happen in the playoffs. So um, uh, it kind of brought me up. I seen a Kobe Bryant video talking about last year, talking about uh, James Harden, how he just doesn't think that type of offense can win. You're not, you're having a guy that's dominate the ball. They said that defense is key on that in the playoffs, especially when they have time to game plan and stuff like that. So he said they need some movement uh, behind the defense, some cutting without the ball, which doesn't seem to be happening. So it doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, and it's an interesting vibe on that, you know, because you saw it, like you said, they had a lot of regular season success when they made the change. They got rid of Capella. It looked like they were kind of gelling yeah. it, but when they had time to figure him out over a seven-game series, you heard LeBron, exactly. he was like, all we had to do was see the speed, and now mm-hmm. we're good. Yeah. And for you, like, you know, those adjustments as a player, do you think something was missing with adjustments, with coaching? Like, just overall, what is your feeling on on that situation with the Rockets? Uh, you're talking about in terms of them trying to get that next piece to step up to that next level? Yeah, just in order, like, you know, yeah. was it a coaching thing? Was there – should there have been adjustments made? Do you think they stuck with the small ball too long? Like, I don't know, man. It seemed like they were just in that small ball rotation and yeah. had no other options when the Lakers were able to adjust, whether it was big or small. Yeah, I think it's because, uh, yeah, their whole organization is detail-oriented to where – they take away the big man and take away the mid-range game. So it's kind of hard to make that big of an adjustment when your whole roster is centered around guys that could play off James Harden that are drive, dribble, and shoot, but not really have that big size of strength. So I think it's going to have to – it wouldn't be really an adjustment. They could make that easily. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good, like, analysis too. Like, the way they set up their roster, like, they can adjust, mm-hmm. right? They have no yeah. other – either works – or it does not work. And if it doesn't work, it looks bad. And like you saw, I think you saw a lot of frustration from the, from the Rockets players mm-hmm. as, as well. I know you wanted to talk about Russ too, getting a little frustrated there at the end of, at the, end of the game. Yeah, Five. man, it's crazy. Who would have thought in 2020 we'd have uh, Russ getting into it with some uh, fan base that only has 12 people. Like, that's crazy <laughs> to me, man. <laughs> yeah, I saw something interesting too. I think it said that uh, it was Rhonda's brother, which I – from her from uh, the reports that he actually runs the barber shop in the bubble. So he's going to be talking and mess to all the other players uh, the next day when he's cutting people hair. They said the barber shop's about to be lit. So that's super funny to me, man. Oh, man, I didn't know he was actually the one there running the barber shop. That's crazy. That's what I guess so. I didn't know that either. So I guess Rondo got the plug for the brother, man. And, uh, he's in there talking <laughs> shit, man. That's crazy. Hey, Rondo always does stay lined up, man. So you can't really. Man, yeah, you know, so it makes like sense. It, it yeah. makes sense. But what do you think about Russ in general, man? Because, you know, there's a lot of, like Will said, there's a lot of emotion that comes out of that team. And we've seen it for years now with Russell Westbrook, man. He, he yeah. plays his high-intensity style. He goes 100 miles an hour. 
And then it gets to a point where a fan says one thing to him or maybe somebody's waving a little bit to him yeah. and he takes it real personal and gets frustrated. You think Russ, like, is that something he can overcome? What do you, I mean, he's, he's almost at the end of his prime now. Like, is yeah. that something that he can overcome or is that just part of his game? Man, when I look into his eyes, when he gets that look like he's about to take over in the fourth quarter, you can see it. That's just all his, in his mindset to me. So he's always had skill set. And so I think what sets him apart is just that drive and that passion. And so I think if you're going to try to take away that passion from the other side, parts of his life or what is his relationships with the fans and stuff, it'll kind of take away from his uh, kind of passion and heart that goes with basketball. So I think those two and two just go in hand. And so I think it's something that you're going to have to live with when you got Russ on your roster. He's going to go all out all 81 games. He's going to play his hardest, but then he also might have those – off the court kind of fiasco. So I found something that you're just going to have to give and take if you have him. That's so true, man. That's what makes him great, but that's also like kind yeah, of his skills. Exactly. Skill. Speaking of like mm -hmm. passion, and I personally, I think lack thereof, we got to talk about the Clippers and the Nuggets. And the, the Nuggets mm -hmm. look like they're about, they, they're on the verge of having two back to back series where they're down 3 1 and possibly coming back to win. Justin, what's your take on that series, man? What, what do you think is going on there? I think we're seeing a lot of the, the Clippers kind of giving, like, giving the Nuggets an opportunity when they shouldn't. The Clippers yeah. were clearly the favorite, clearly the best team coming yeah. in. And the Nuggets are the team that, no, you know, everybody counts them out when they're down 3-1. Everybody counts them down when they have yeah. a 15-point deficit. And then they come back. They don't quit. And they got guys, you know, it's, even though it's centered around Murray and Jokic a lot, uh, they got mm. guys coming off the bench making plays, some, some veterans and then rookies who are really taking it by the horns too. We've talked at length about Michael Porter Jr. and his impact on the game. But I think that that team doesn't quit. And you can tell that that system, a lot of people, you know, talk about Malone, Mike Malone and, and what yeah. he does or doesn't do with the rookies. He gets a lot of slack. That team is bought sure. in. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's crazy. Um, what makes me uh, kind of think is how dedicated are the Clippers? Like, you yeah. already had guys like Lou, man. Is he really that invested in the season if he's out there at the strip club during the, <laughs> during the bubble time? And so, yeah, these Nuggets guys, they seem to be locked in, man, which I think was a big testament to, like you said, the coach having those guys ready for those games and willing to battle it out. Yeah, and the veteran presence to me, I think, is the thing that's kind of really struck me with this Nuggets team is they have a lot of young guys that lead them, but their veterans all stepped up when you have a Millsap, when you got the Jeremy Grants of the world coming in and playing high minutes at a high level. Um, you know, to me, that makes yeah. a big difference in a team like the Clippers, who also has the veteran presence. But like you said, maybe maybe lacking the focus is where they're, they're losing it. You know, Will, yeah. where do you think? Where do you think that they, you know, this game goes with game seven? Like, do you see that same type of vibe heading into game seven? Or you think they're going to flip it around? I mean, looking at the, I don't know if you guys saw the end of the game. Um, it's like the Clippers, they walked off the court before the game was actually over. I don't I know saw if you that. noticed yeah. that. Mm -hmm. It's almost like they're checked out, you know? And it's mm -hmm. been like that almost all year, like with guys sitting out, missing games. Um, yeah. Just not showing up in certain situations. It seems like they feel like they can turn it on and off. But I think they've given so much confidence to the Nuggets now, like, that they're going to be hard to beat, man, especially a dude like Jamal Murray. If they have players who can just get hot and torch you in a, in a one-game situation. So, I, if, you know, if I was the, the Clippers, if I was a Clippers fan, I would be very, very worried about this game seven because you never know what can happen, man. You never yeah. know. Who you got, Cody? Who you think wins this game seven that we got coming up? Man, first of all, I got to say, man, who would have thought that Jamal Murray had that in him? Before this playoffs, Whoa. I did not expect those 50-point games. I thought he was a guy, but I didn't think he was the guy. So he's definitely proving me wrong in this series for sure. But uh, who I got in that game seven, you know what? I'm such a big believer in Kawhi, man. I think he's a generational talent, and his mindset is just so different. I think he will be able to will these Clippers team to a dub. But I definitely think they're – and for a lot of trouble, I know the Nuggets are definitely not going to give up. They're not going to let them have it easy. Yeah, and Kawhi, man, it's it's funny. <clears throat> you know, he's had it locked in. Like, this entire playoffs, you can tell when the playoffs start, yeah. he's a different breed. He's been mm -hmm. locked in this entire playoffs. And where he's lacked is that supporting cast. You get Lou Will going off for a game and then going quiet for, for four or five games. You yep. get Paul George going through his, you know, whatever mental things he has going on, yeah. playing hot and then playing cold. 
the bigs, it's like Zubac will play well, Harrow will play well. Like, mm-hmm. They haven't had it all locked in together, it feels like, for a yeah. four or five game stretch this entire playoffs. And yeah. I think for me, that's, that's definitely scary. I'm actually going to go with the Nuggets. I feel yeah. like they've kind of found an identity with, uh, with Murray, Jokic, and then adding Michael Porter and his confidence in this playoffs gives me a reason to think that they may not be the better team. They just got the momentum right now, man. It just yeah. looks like they want it and that they're destined to move on. Yeah. Definitely. What do you think about uh, the Michael Porter Jr. comments after the last game? So here are my thoughts on Michael Porter Jr. I think what he yeah. said was wrong. But at the end of the day, if he didn't say that, it was going to get swept under the rug. It may mm-hmm. not have come out in the comments. It may not have been brought to the attention that it needed to. But I think that what happened is when you're outspoken with something like that, could be yeah. ill time because it's in the playoffs and it probably should have been kept in house. Yeah. But I'm not sure we see the same fire out of him and the rest of the team like we've been seeing. Yeah, right. So, no. I wonder if it's something that he said before in the locker room. Everyone's saying, like, that's got to – you wonder if he said that before and nothing was done. It definitely seems like it made a difference. We saw Paul Millsap go out the last game and then, uh, you know, other guys stepping up, Gary Harris stepping up in this game. So maybe, maybe it is what made the difference. Like, I don't know. What do you think, Cody? You know, you've been inside the locker room before and yeah. in a professional atmosphere. What's your take on that situation overall? Uh, I think uh, NBA locker room is a lot like a family. And so you'll have family members that might be kind of different or whatever, but you got to get along. Everyone has to get along if you're going to be able to reach that ultimate goal. And so I think it's definitely something that should have been said uh, either face to face or something that shouldn't have been in the media, which we don't know. He could have said this already before and then nothing may have happened and he may have had to speak up. But I think if you're going to be a voice, that opinion, especially a guy that's like a rookie like that, that's kind of doesn't have as many experience in the league, you definitely got to go keep it in-house first. So I'm not sure if he did that or not, but that's just what I would do if I was in that same position. Well, it looks like it to me. It looked like it yeah. worked, man. It, it seems to have worked out, though. <laughs> definitely. It seemed to so work out. So props to him, man. He's different for thinking like that. Yeah. yeah. That shows he's, a, he's a different he's a different type of dude. Yes. He is. I think everybody's seen the talent. They've seen the, the capability. Oh, yeah. So hopefully it all works out for him. We'll see. Yeah. It's going to be a man. tough interview. It is what it stuff. is. Yeah, man. The Western Conference is, is the playoffs have been great. I think that the matchups are great. And whether we get the Clippers in Denver, we get Clippers and um, – I'm sorry, we get Lakers in, in Nuggets or we get Lakers and Clippers. It's going to be a good matchup either way. But I want to touch, yeah. touch on this Eastern Conference, man. Because there's been a couple surprises. What are your thoughts? First, Cody, I want to hear your thoughts on the Bucks getting knocked out and eliminated as the number one seed in the entire league. Yeah, man. It just uh, – I think it, people, that makes people trying to question how really good is Giannis? Is he the Michael Jordan or is he the Scottie Pippen? And so – yeah, it's got me to think, like, that type of player, like, you're not going to get swept or yeah, taken out that early in the yeah, playoffs. If you're yeah. an MVP unanimous, what, is it back-to-back? I don't know, man. It, it makes me kind of question what Giannis has up. But he's a guy that works extremely hard. And so I know it. he wouldn't be afraid of trying to build something in Milwaukee because a lot of people are trying to say, oh, he's skipping town. He's going to try to win somewhere else. He's built what he has been in this league basically from ground up. You've seen him in his rookie year, how skinny and how tiny that man was. So, you know, he can put hard work in. So he might be willing to stick it out with Milwaukee, but who knows? Yeah, and I don't know. We'll see if he goes somewhere. The, obviously, the consensus is that he's probably going to be leaving, um, or at least he's in, yeah. intrigued by the idea of leaving, and it looks like the Bucks are potentially exploring options. He unfollowed all the his teammates, and he unfollowed the Bucks. so we'll see <laughs> yeah, where it probably, goes. Yeah. But yeah. I don't know. I, I think that Giannis is the player that has the capability of looking like a superstar on paper, but it might just be a paper superstar, kind of what we've seen with like Harden. I think that their impact is more of like yeah, they could dominate cool. a game. Maybe not a series yeah. of game plan for, you know? But not win. True. Very exactly. true. So, Will, what do you, what do you think, man? The, the Bucks got eliminated, um, and that leaves us with Heat, and that leaves us with the Celtics, man. We just saw a pretty good Celtics-Raptors series, too, man. What are your thoughts on this Eastern Conference and how it's played out so far? Yeah, I definitely think we're in for another really good series, man. I really like this matchup. I, li- I think these teams are really similar. Like, I, I think they're, they're both – Solid offensively, really good defensively. They have they're really tough. They're well coached. 
Um, they have really good culture within their systems. Like, I think this is going to be a great – I'm looking for a six or seven game series for sure out of, this, out of these two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could easily see that. And I know, Cody, yeah. you're probably looking at this series like, man, there's some, some good talent on, this, on both of these rosters, man. What are your thoughts on this yeah. Heat Celtic series? Yeah, it should be a great series, man. Uh, like you said, a lot of good young guys that are on either squad that can come off and score. But I think we kind of both had that same culture, that winning culture, which I think goes a long ways. And so, yeah, I uh, got one of my guys on uh, behind the Miami Heat bench, uh, Gabe Vincent. And so, yeah, he kind of uh, came and got, got – gave me the inside knowledge on kind of how much he like likes and how much different that Miami heat culture is. He says they're super about like committed to winning and they'll do anything for it. So I think I got a, a long series, like you said, six or seven is going to be a battle. It's going to be some great TV, but I think I have the heat coming out in the end. Yeah. That's some yeah. good intel, man. And, and we've talked about the culture, man. It's, it's crazy because they are locked in. You can just tell all those mm -hmm. guys are locked in. I think Jimmy Butler said he's like not even inviting his family there so that he can stay exactly. locked in. Business trip. Business <laughs> trip, dude. And yeah. What is it about that? You know, what makes a locker room like that? Because, you know, there's obviously there's those types of players all over the league. There's those types mm -hmm. of coaches all over the league. But what makes the, the, the actual environment like that to where it's so conducive that everybody, even the guys on the bench, in the game, coaching staff, training staff, they all buy in? What makes it like that? Yeah, I think it starts with good communication. I think it starts from the top. And when your leaders are the ones that are working hard, that are not taking any breaks and are the hardest people in the room, it's going to automatically elevate the rest of the people, whether that's in the front office or on the actual team to elevate their own games and bring it up to that level. So I think it starts with on the team, obviously Jimmy Butler, he's the one that to me has that mentality, like, man, nothing's going to stop us and we're going to do anything it takes to win. And then I'm a uh, Pat Riley, I think in the front office, he's another guy that I heard is super locked in Spolstra super locked in. So yeah. I think it starts from the top trips it way down and you have a good, uh, good culture you can maintain. Yeah, that's one thing that doesn't get talked about a lot is, is Pat Riley, man. All that dude does is win, man. Like, everywhere he's been, and he's he's definitely a culture guy, and they bring in the right type of people. They know the type yeah. of people that are in their system. So he's been huge. great for them. Yeah, huge. Yeah, he has. And I look at the other side of the court, too, and they are a well-coached team with a guy that likes to win, Danny Ainge. And I know mm -hmm. that they're going to put up a threat, man. They're going to take that seven games, or at least it's going to be a really competitive series. We've talked about two guys on that team, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. Now, I want to get your feedback on those players individually. What makes Jason Tatum go? What makes Jalen Brown go? Because you've seen, you know, Jay Jason Tatum's made some tough shots, man. He's a tough shot taker. Mm -hmm. And then I think that Jalen Brown doesn't get a lot of the love that he deserves offensively and defensively. What's your take on that duo for the Boston Celtics? To me, I think that's their future. I think if they're going to try to invest in the win, you could ride those two guys out for, what, 10 more years damn near. Those guys are young. They're hungry. And I think their development from their rookie years to where they're at now kind of speaks to how hard work they are. Uh, I don't remember Tatum hitting those ISO moves like he was in his rookie right. year that he's doing now. So I think that just shows how much he's willing to improve, how much he's willing to work in the offseason. And same as Brown, a uh, guy out of, uh, out of Cal, kind of maybe not a little bit under the radar. He's showing his athletic ability and his ability to make shots. And so I think these are two guys, the Celtics, if they're inter really uh, interested in winning, they're going to keep hold on to these two guys. Yeah, they're built differently, man. And, and I think they, like you said, they make tough shots. And they seem like they play really well together, too. And Exactly, uh, that too, for sure. They don't let a lot of the other little things affect them. Like, they're pretty even killed. They don't get too high. They don't get too mm -hmm. low, which is what you like to see out of anybody that's, lead, like you mentioned, the leader of the team that can kind of, yeah. you know, take that by the horns and make sure that the rest of the team goes. And, you know, even the leaders of the team right now, um, mentioning the coaches and the GM, some of them don't even have access to their families there in the bubble. I want to talk about that a little bit too. Have you heard anything about the bubble conditions, what it's like out there, what the players or coaches are going through, whether they have their family there or not? 
Yeah, so um, I was able to catch up with my guy, Kyle Guy, uh, the Sacramento Kings, man. Got to play some golf with him after he got back from the bubble. And so we kind of really didn't get into, like, specific details of, like, what exactly they were eating or, like, how are the conditions, uh, like, the actual living conditions. So I just got to a sense of those off what people have been posting on social media and stuff. So it basically to me looks like they're trapped in a hotel, which I know I've been on the road for – I mean, at the most, maybe like three or four weeks. And that was tough, just being in the hotel, living day to day. So I can't imagine what the two, three months that these guys are spending out there, isolated, uh, not in their right environment, not in their home. They can't drive home and get away from the game mentally. They're, they're stuck in it. So I know it's got to be tough that way. And so what he was talking to me mostly about was uh, the fun stuff. Like, he said he got a lot of golf in. Mm. He said he got a lot of fi uh, fishing in. So he said he had fun out there. They gave him stuff to do. Obviously, they're going to be treated, well, like, as best as they could with the amenities. But it looks like they got a water park. I seen Taco Fall trying to learn how to swim. So I think, <laughs> I think they got a lot of interest and stuff out there. So in that type of sense. Hell yeah, on the amenities, man. I, yeah. I've been really curious to see. I don't know if you guys have seen the effect of this, but how the more people coming to the bubble has affected the players. I'd be, I'm kind of curious to see that, like some players not having their family. I think what's really interesting is now we saw this with with Rondo and Russ. Like now there's fans at the mm -hmm. game, kind of hear yeah. them too. It, was, it yeah. reminds me of the old like AAU game where there's like because nice. four... <laughs> you can hear one parent just screaming louder than other yeah, parents. Yeah, man. I wonder how that affects the the bubble or just the kind of the overall like feeling of it you know what i mean to have yes. there i wonder if that's if that's impacting it at all dude i kind of wish they like kind of flipped that camera and yeah like give us a sense of who's actually in that crowd because you don't really yeah. get to see those guys you know you, uh, they're focused on the court with all the cameras so it'd be interesting to see who's actually there how many for sure dude and it's it is getting kind of intense there dude it almost feels like Fortnite. you know everything's closing in and it's like you know the players mm. are there, <laughs> walk by them eventually the like circles getting smaller and smaller yeah bro like yeah. i feel like eventually like there's gonna be some some big tension there pretty soon i don't know man living in the same spot the same people and their families as you're playing against in a competitive seven game series for a title i i wonder what the brush outside of the court conversations are like there right now you know yeah, I, I think I called it right when this bubble was announced. I, I called, I said, there's going to be one real fight that's going to happen in the bubble, like actual fist fight. Yeah. Because I think these guys are just too close together. It's such a competitive environment. Now you're having your girlfriend who might have been with the, your other teammate who's on the other team. Like, it's, yeah. it's a lot of stuff that could happen, man. So yeah, I they're not letting uh, Kendall definitely... Jenner in the bubble, right? Exactly, man. <laughs> there's going to be some tensions rising. It's going to get interesting. So, yeah. It's All definitely right, something that we've never seen before, man. Yeah. Dude, I wonder if they would ever take this further than just this year, you know, if they make that a competitive thing. or yeah. It'd probably be tough to take players away from their family, but got to yeah. love what you're seeing in the bubble so far, man. For sure. Well, Cody, appreciate you coming on the show, man. We'll definitely have you on again soon. And uh, let us know. Who do you guys think wins Game 7? And who do you think wins the Eastern Conference? Let us know if you agree with our take. Be sure to be on the lookout for new episodes coming up. Just Hook Talk. Be subscribed. Another edition in the books. We out. Peace. Much love. For more NBA, college, and hoops coverage, be sure to subscribe to Just Hoop Talk Podcast on YouTube and all streaming platforms.